Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we will be discussing a case of a middle-aged female who presented to our ER uh, with complaints of fever, uh, following which she had a trauma, following that she developed chest pain. Okay. Can we begin, sir? A 58-year-old female patient uh, presented to our ER uh, with a history of on and off uh, fever for about 5 days. Prior to this, she had taken COVID-19 vaccination mm. and uh, in this period of five days not just fever she also developed giddiness and she's had a history of fall she claims to have had uh, sustained trauma to the uh, right side of the chest predominantly in the right breast okay. this was the complaints that she came up with so in our initial 10 second assessment patient was talking comprehending obeying our commands we moved on to the primary survey wherein patient's airway was patent uh, with adequate chest excursions and also no anatomical deformity, drooling okay. saliva, nothing of that sort was seen. So breathing wise also patient had bilateral air entry being equal, had a respiratory rate of 18 cycles per minute, maintaining a saturation of about 99% in room air. Um, chest was also clear on auscultation. Uh, circulation wise she had a heart rate of about 84 beats per minute, maintaining blood pressure of 130 over 60. And all peripheral pulses, um, um, pulses were palpable and warm extremities. Mm -hmm. Disability wise, GCS score was full, pupils were reactive, GRBS was in the exposure wise 137 milligram per deciliter and temperature was normal 38.6 mm -hmm. degrees Celsius. So in our primary survey, the thing that we did was uh, take a ECG because she complained of chest pain. Okay. Now the chest pain, uh, ECG, our first ECG itself showed a pattern with broad uh, regular rhythm uh, sinus and broad QRS complexes with dominant S waves. Hmm. So with this, we clinched the diagnosis for an LBBB, but that okay. was not a new change in her hmm. because hmm. the new onset LBBB will have to take it as a STEMI. So we uh, referred our previous ECGs of hers in our system and we figured that this patient was already a known case of dilated cardiomyopathy with okay. LBBB. So, LBBB is a feature of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, you can get LBBB. LBBB. But how you know that it is not MI? Uh, we have something called the Scarbosa criteria yes, yes. Sir, that we do to see if a patient uh, with LBBB has an MI or not. So, okay. according to this criteria, one of the major point is we'll have to have ST elevation more than 5 okay. mm in uh, V1, V2, V3 okay. or ST depressions of more than 1 mm in contiguous leads predominantly in the V2, V3 area. Okay. So this patient, we ran the scarbosa criteria. The most criteria. important criteria is uh, uh, concordance, concordance or discordance. If you see this ECG, what is this given in this ECG? Is it a concordance pattern or discordant pattern? You can see here. This is this. This is a uh, white complex. It's negative complex. Mm. But following that, uh, ST is upright. That means it is discordant. Discordant. discordant is a. Uh, uh, it's, it's a normal LBBB pattern. Discordant. Okay. So. Concordant means it is significant. Okay. Mm. It's not concordant. But even then, uh, patient does not have any chest pain. Chest but pain. LBBB was there in the. Uh, past history. Uh, okay. So it was not a new finding, okay. so which is why this ECG was not that alarming. Okay. But the other thing that we noticed is we repeated the ECG after about an hour and that had VPCs. Okay. So we had to look into the drug history to see if the patient was on any uh, in, uh, drugs that could have triggered a VPC. Okay. And then we found out that the patient was on digoxin. Okay. Uh, so um, you are seeing uh, in this rhythm strip, you are seeing one, two, three, four, five uh, VPCs. Is it significant? Yes, sir, because VPCs, if at all, they increase in number, okay. any time the patient can throw a ventricular arrhythmia. Arrhythmia, okay. So, what are, uh, what are abnormalities you can see in a VPC? When you are seeing this abnormality, you should admit the patient, okay. Suppose I am seeing only one VPC in a ECG, it is not significant. But in ER, when you get a, get a case like this and you are seeing <coughs> VPCs on the screen, when you tell it is uh, significant? Three, more than three. Okay, numbers, when the numbers are increasing, that is definitely a problematic. Otherwise, other than the numbers. QTC prolongation. QTC prolongation is different. Like not sustained VT, NSVT. No, NSVT is different. Ectopic alone, ventricular ectopic, we are seeing in a monitor or in a ECG like this. When will you tell it is significant? One is number, as she told, if the numbers are increasing, more than certain level, it is definitely a, a bad thing. Otherwise, 
the gap between them is decreasing. Yeah. QRS widening, sir. Yeah. Either you are seeing bigemini. Bigemini means yeah. alternate. Alternate. Or you are seeing couplets or tri triplets. That means a, a, a continuous VPCs mm -hmm. or polymorphic VPCs. VPCs. The morphology of ventricular premature complex is different in each or one or two, three are you are seeing. Mm -hmm. Then also it is uh, like a patient yeah. can go to problem. Okay. Yeah. If a patient who is fully stable, you are taking an ECG, you are seeing some ectopic in the ECG, what you will advise the patient? How do you know that it's significant VPC? You ask the patient to walk a few minutes, repeat the ECG. If it is a malignant VPC, means that it's due to a problem, the numbers will increase. If the VPC is coming down, then it's a normal physiological or benign VPC. So that has to be done. How do you know it is VPC or APC? Sir, Atrial uh, premature complex, ventricular, ventricular premature. How do you know it is? So, in uh, ventricular premature complexes, P waves will be absent okay. and QRS will be widened. White. And then atrial, it will be exactly opposite, wherein you will have a P wave and mm. the QRS, no, no, you won't have a P. You, atrial premature complex, so atrial will be, be so P wave will, P be, will there. be there. Narrow QRS complex. complex is narrow. narrow. Then compensatory pause? Will be there. Oh. It is? Short. It is partial. Short. But Short whereas end. this is? Fully we'll compensation. Long, that means okay. it will exactly whatever you are seeing uh, in one lead. Mm -hmm. If you take two complexes, it will be exactly double of the yeah. one complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. So compensatory for pause, pause is, is there. there. Okay. What is interpolated ectopic? Uh, in between. So you it comes exactly so where a normal complex comes. That is interpolated ect mm -hmm. ectopic. That is also not a good sign. So all these things are bad signs. Mm -hmm. Suppose you are seeing an ectopic in the emergency room. You ask the patient to walk for some time. Repeat the ECG. If they are disappearing, then it is well and good. The patient is stable on that uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. But if the numbers are increasing, if you are seeing bigemini, couplets, triplets, or polymorphic VPCs, all are significant. Interpolated ectopics. What is R on T phenomenon? R wave falls on T wave. On T -wave. Okay. That is also significant. This patient can develop. Ventricular mm -hmm. tachycardia. So, all these things are dangerous signs in uh, ventricular ectopics. Mm -hmm. We have to be very careful when you are seeing a ventricular ectopic. We should know this, uh, uh, whether it is monomorphic, polymorphic, mm -hmm. bigemini, couplets, triplets, r on t phenomena, everything is important. Okay, simply uh, telling it is ectopic it doesn't it's mean anything sense. for a ER physician. Okay. So, here it is uh, more or like, uh, less like a bigemini, but it is not exactly bigemini. After two Normal complexes, you are getting a ectopic beat. Okay, so, so it's yes. not bigemini, but it will become soon bigemini if you don't find out the reason. Yeah. So in another four five hours of span, we repeated it. Okay. In the second repeat. Then it has become bigemini. bigemini. That means uh, his problem has increased. Uh. Okay. So uh, then we reviewed the patient's back history. So in the mm -hmm. sample history, we found out that the patient was a known case of diabetes, hypertension. CKD, mm. COPD, and patient also had hypothyroidism. She had she developed hypothyroidism crisis also a couple of years okay. ago, and okay. she was recovered from then on. Okay. And ever since then, she has had severe LV with dilated cardiomyopathy, and LBBP was her, was her normal thing. Okay. Okay. So possibly the causes of dilated cardiomyopathy can be because of the long-standing hypertension. Mm -hmm. uh, because family so and genetics. Just think that will hypertension cause a dilated cardiomyopathy? Will it cause? Sir, uh, it normally it produces cause. concentric LVH. And later, due to some complication only, they develop dilated uh, mm -hmm. uh, LVH. Le dilated left ventricle, not LVH. Mm -hmm. LV hypertrophy is a feature of hypertensive heart disease, not LV dilatation. Dilatation can be due to ischemic heart disease or something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can it be due to hypothyroidism? Yes, sir. Both hypothyroid, actually predominantly hypothyroidism or high Hypothyroidism or again produces again concentric, concentric LV. Hyperthyroidism produces, produces dilated LV. So, so most, mostly high output states like hypothyroidism, beriberi is the, are the ones who okay. cause dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. But So when the patient is on also. treatment with uh, thyroid uh, medicines, we should always think that whether the patient is getting over treatment or not. And that we have to confirm. Mm -hmm. What is the TSH value? We have to confirm whether the patient is going for on opposite side, whether they are over treated or not. Okay. okay sir. Uh, so those were her comorbidities. And uh, coming over to the medications that she's daily on, she's on furosemoid 40 mm -hmm. mg that she takes 
twice daily mm. that is uh, then isolazine iso she takes tid with echosprin is hydralazine hydralazine and then echosprin 75 mg and mm. then carbidolol 6.25 mg bd digoxin she takes 0.25 mg but it's only half tablet in the okay. morning so uh, creatinine side so they have made the, it half the, yeah they have reduced the dose because mm. of uh, patient is a known case of ckd can you tell the indications three. for digoxin digoxin one of the major or the only indication these days is when a patient has af and is in heart failure okay that is only indication nowadays for digoxin, digoxin. that is because of its side effects mm. what is the side effect of so digoxin digoxin has like it affects multiple systems mm. like apart from the uh, regular nausea or vomiting diarrhea but the mm. major thing is in the cardiovascular system okay. it causes uh, arrhythmias either okay. it can be like uh, ventricular arrhythmias or it can predominantly cause uh bradyca like av blocker features okay. so you'll have slow af or um, oh, any okay. yeah complete heart block any okay. cardio depressant bradycardia okay. will, will so digoxin will produce almost all types of arrhythmias, arrhythmias. in the heart okay mm -hmm. same time it is uh, anti arrhythmic it is also a pro arrhythmic drug mm -hmm. so okay so when a patient and besides it also is known to have a very narrow therapeutic index mm -hmm. which is why when a patient is and also is notorious to have drug interactions with a lot of other drugs okay so when a patient is on digoxin we have to not just monitor the digoxin levels but also have to take ecgs to find out any patient has any toxicity levels okay. and when we are prescribing new medications to the patient it is utterly important to check so the in emergency drug room for us uh, two drugs are very very important sorry three drugs warfarin phenytoin and, and digoxin. digoxin whenever we are seeing this type of drugs whatever drug we prescribe we have to see the drug interaction mm -hmm. sometimes it can go high or go down so we have to be very careful when we are prescribing this type of drugs okay what is brash syndrome brash syndrome is basically a uh, it's an acronym mm -hmm. for bradycardia renal failure mm -hmm. av uh, nodal blocks, blocks. and then s stands for shock and h okay. stands for hyperkalemia okay so this so, patient has got bradycardia is there shock is not there but he is on digoxin he is on beta blocker mm -hmm. and uh, any time he can develop that type of syndrome it can be a partial syndrome now yeah, so we have to be very careful so this is generally seen when a patient it's a thing that is seen when patient started on an av node blockers okay. like digoxin like you mentioned so digoxin okay. beta blockers that's why they have made it half dose so half that dose. is a normal strategy when there is renal failure we make the digoxin to half dose okay mm -hmm. what type of beta blockers are ideal in renal failure a uh, specific cardiac it's a short, shortest acting beta blocker which is the shortest acting beta S1. blocker carvedilol carvedilol Carvedil is a long long it means bd dose we give metoprolol is the long shortest acting short metoprolol acts for 6 hours that's why we give metoprolol sr in controlling the bp sr acts for 12 to 24 hours mm -hmm. otherwise metoprolol is the ideal drug to be given in a renal failure in emergency settings because we don't know this patient's renal clearance so if you are giving a long acting drug like uh, this type of drugs it will act for uh, for an additional 12 or 24 hours mm -hmm. okay so we should be very careful when we are starting beta blockers in renal failure ideally we give metoprolol so that is a short acting drug that itself will become long acting drug in a renal failure patient okay so apart from these drug interactions we and also in an emergency setting generally patient will come with history of pain like in this patient following a trauma or something mm -hmm. and then that case we have to be very careful to so not give what NSAIDs. pain drugs you can give in, in, in this, this anything but nsaids can be given actually okay. with tramadol also digoxin is known to have okay, uh, interaction. interactions it increases the toxicity digoxin. levels okay. It increases the concentration okay. of the digoxin. So here, what will be ideal drug for us? Paracetamol. Paracetamol is the safest drug. drug. Mm -hmm. What we can give for this patient? Mm -hmm. Okay. And NSAIDs also cannot be given one because okay. of interaction and second of because of the patient's underlying Cardiac comorbidities yeah, okay. itself and severe LV dysfunction. Okay. Then apart from drug interactions, the other thing to keep in mind is the electrolytes of mm -hmm. the patient because hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypercalcemia are known to cause. Digoxin, uh, digoxin level toxicity okay. increases. So all of this was checked at these patient in this patient. So apart from this, the patient was on uh, amitriptyline and OHAs okay. along with insulin. Okay. So but none of these is known to like cause any interactions with digoxin okay. as such. Uh, then uh, apart from ECGs and this one is sent for cardiac enzymes. That mm. cardiac enzymes did not. Really what OHA is taking? Do you want to check the OHAs in that list? 
uh, OH is sulfonylurea, hmm. that is patient is taking uh, glycomet and along with that metformin. Okay, both are safe in cardiac disease, which is not safe in cardiac disease, cardiac failure patient. Pyoglitazone. 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 Because it produces fluid retention. retention. So, pyoglitazone is a not a good choice in patient who is having cardiac failure. So, that sometimes, sometime back it was banned, but, but now again it is available, but it should not be prescri prescribed for this type of patients. Okay. So, uh, we had to rule out even features of, because of the underlying severe LV and uh, um, dilated cardiomyopathy with recurrent heart failure history in the past, heart failure also had to be ruled out in this patient. Okay. How do you rule out heart failure? What is the BP in this patient? This patient had 130-60, just like a good BP. Okay. So, in a patient who is having cardiac failure, what happened to the BP? BP, severe LV patients will have low BP. Low Baseline systolic itself BP. Low systolic BP. Low diastolic BP can, can be elevated in a patient who is having associated systemic hypertension. Mm -hmm. But normally, somebody is having cardiac failure, their systolic BP will be low. But mm -hmm. still, we have to check the echo and find out what is the actual BP. Actual. Okay. So, um, that was also ruled out and then the uh, patient also had like complaints of um, left chest pain was there but predominantly she localized it to the breast. Okay. So, considering how she is postmenopausal also, we had to do the uh, breast examination to find out any uh, okay. malignancy. Okay. Um, so, in that... Uh, then the mammography was done. Size okay. of the primary malignancy. Okay. Uh, so Mammography to... will be very difficult from ER because somebody had fallen down, hit mm. on the breast. It will be painful. painful. Uh, so normally, we do not do it. Mm. Okay, patient may not agree for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it was done. Mm. Okay. okay. Yes, done. After admission was done. Okay. That After was... relief of pain, mm. it was done. Yeah. That's, that's the patient part, sir. But uh, when we are discussing about the uh, Degox in the dilated cardiomyopathy, mm. that areas. One of the other things, the dilated cardiomyopathy can cause is conduction disturbances, which okay. we see in this. And also the other thing that we have to keep in mind is a thromboembolic so event. So, you are seeing this ECG. Is there a degoxin effect in this patient? Sir, so, uh, when we are looking for degoxin effect, we will find downsloping ST depressions. Mm. Okay. Uh, that is the reverse popularly tick called as reverse tick sign or okay. salvador dialysis okay. stats. That is not there, maybe because of the LBBB pattern, pattern. it, is, uh, it is either masked or removed from the ECG by uh, like uh, normal physiology. Okay. But normally, when the patient is on digoxin, you get reverse moustache sign. Then okay. we will see QTC shortening, okay. uh, PR prolongation, all of that is because of the AV block. Okay. And sometimes we we'll even find U waves also. Okay. That is, if U waves are there, we will have to correct hypokalemia okay. because it will potentiate the effect. Okay. And then uh, the J point elevation can be seen wherein all these ST depressions areas are seen, but these would be the normal findings in digoxin. These are not toxicity okay. toxicity features. But when so, digoxin effect is different from digoxin toxicity, toxicity that we should understand. Digoxin effect unnecessarily it should not be treated. Okay. So, the effect of the drug. Okay. So, when the ECG starts to show digoxin toxicity, meaning patient will have mostly an SVT or any ventricular arrhythmias okay. with increase in the PR. Uh, premature ventricular conductions or slow AF okay. or complete heart block, when these arrhythmias set in or conduction blocks How do you happen, differentiate slow AF from complete heart block with AF? In complete heart block, there will be no P to Q relation. P to P and Q to Q. T Q he is not there in atrial fibrillation. No, no, not able conduction, to complete heart block, sir. Complete heart block. So, you have a patient who is having atrial fibrillation. Normally, we start Digoxin. Some patients can have severe bradycardia, still atrial fibrillation. Is there. Some patients can have cardiac block because of digoxin, still atrial fibrillation will be there. How do you differentiate? This is a common problem which an ER physician faces when the patient comes with uh, uh, bradycardia in atrial fibrillation. So, once the, once the patient is on AF, starts on digoxin, once mm -hmm. the AF starts, starts simply normalizing. Like, you take uh, the RR interval. RR, interval. RR intervals are regular. Uh, then it is blocked. Irregular means it is atrial fibrillation Intervation. with slow ventricular rate. Right. So, whenever you are you are seeing a uh, like a F with severely reduced heart rate, always check the RR interval. If they are coming regularly, then you have to suspect complete, complete heart block. Okay, especially when the patient is on, on digoxin. Digoxin, renal failure, 
atrial fibrillation. This is a combination where you get complete heart block. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same patient can have bradycardia because of the digoxin. Mm -hmm. So, we should make sure that it is not heart block. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in these patients, uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, all mm -hmm. this has to be like cautiously used. Okay. Because that will again exaggerate the um, bradycardia Effect of, of beta, uh, like bradycardia digoxin. digoxin. Then... Uh, uh, other than this, there are like various other interactions like uh, and besides this patient also has dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. Uh, so, uh, anti-malarial agents like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine okay. shouldn't be given. Then, um, then what else? Yeah, whatever drug you are giving when the patient is on digoxin, you have to check the check. interaction. Okay. So, that will rule out so many abnormalities. So, unfortunately, many a times we don't see that we start some drug. It will produce interaction and the ultimately patient will develop. Uh, rhythm abnormality. So, we should be very careful uh, in this type of patients. Mm -hmm. That's why nowadays we don't use digox in most of the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, this may not be a good indication in dilated cardiomyopathy. It is not good. What is the problem in digox? Is, is it going to increase the uh, like uh, prognosis, improve the prognosis? Digoxin never improves the prognosis. Mm -hmm. It only improves the day-to-day -day activity of the patient. It only gives a symptomatic relief to the patient. Okay. It will not uh, improve the systemic condition. So, that only occurs in atrial fibrillation induced cardiac failure. That's why it is only indicated in that condition nowadays. Okay. Okay. But dilated cardiomyopathy, if we start, it improves the ejection okay. fraction transiently, but ultimately patient okay. deteriorates in a regular manner. Okay. So, it will not help the patient. Uh, that's that was the major uh, cardiac history okay. part. Sir. What uh, happened to thyroid function test? The thyroid uh, function test because uh, she was like already on a strict thyroxine hmm. treatment. What is it? TSH? You should know. Uh, TSH is normal. Sir. Normal. They're normalized. Okay. The, normal means what? What is a normal is the TSH? Four. Four. Normal is up to four point two in four. our lab. Okay. Whatever. Whichever. Most of the labs will have zero to four. Zero to four point two. We should keep the TSH below the half of the normal, like 4 means below 2. That is the ideal thing. But in this patient, if it is very low, near to 0, then we should be very careful. Patient may be getting over treatment of a thyroid ta tablet. That itself can produce a cardio cardiac failure. Okay, So, we should be very careful when we are giving thyroid uh, hormone replacement in this type of patients. Okay, What happened to the breast? Uh, to the best part, we that was like totally on an unrelated scale. We mm. incidentally found the patient to have a uh, suspicious axillary lymph node was there with birads of four. Okay. So uh, we had to take a biopsy, which we've taken of the axillary lymph node okay. for further management, and biopsy re reports are awaited. Okay. So depending on if it all, since birads is little on the suspicious level of malignancy, mm. if at all patient turns out to be malignant, then we'll have to like give the referral to the oncology relevant departments. Okay. But so far we are waiting for the biopsy reports. Okay. What are the triple drug regimes can be used in cardiac failure? Uh, triple beta blockers. Beta blockers. Then, then a Lasix diuretics. Di it is not di Lasix. It is diuretics. spironolactone. Spironol. It is not Lasix. It is spironolactone. Spironol. But Lasix will be given along with spironolactone mm -hmm. because there is a powerful diuretic but we want aldosterone mm -hmm. antagonist. Mm -hmm. Potassium sparing drug mm -hmm. with aldosterone antagonism. So, we give spironolactone. Mm -hmm. And third one is beta AC inhibitor or IR. So, these are the three drugs should be started uh, for patient who is having cardiac Heart failure pain. because of dilated cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. Fourth drug may be? No, no. It is not something like digoxin. It is sorbitrate. Okay. So, uh, to, to improve the ischemic part. Okay. So, triple drug therapies, beta blocker, uh, spironolactone, AC inhibitor or IRB. You mm -hmm. can even add uh, sorbitrate or uh, nitrates along with this. Okay. If the patient develops a cardiac failure mm. in your ICU, how do you manage in this patient? In this patient, if the patient... Cardiac is, failure means hypotension. Um, Can we give fluids? No. In this patient, it is mostly a diastolic... No. Systolic... This, yeah, this patient is having cardiac, cardiac failure. Cardiac so, it is mostly systolic, systolic. Uh, dilated cardiac, systolic cardiac failure. We can give a challenge of 
fluid to see if it if improves. If we don't know that, we can give it a fluid on. challenge in a peripheral setting. But here, yes. we, we know that patient is fluid overload, patient is having cardiac failure. We will not try Early uh, inotropes. what we will start. We will start with norad first. Okay. Ideally, drug no, is noradrenaline norad always. And then, if then the patient uh, uh, wants the BP improves to 100, systolic BP improves to 100, dobutamol. So, here in this condition, dobutamol will be ideal. So, noradrenaline, dobutamol can be started. Mm. Okay. Thank you.